Well, good morning, everyone. There is a, an issue that is facing our community. And I guess it's not just our community, but we're going to talk about our community. And that is that many people have an unbalanced view of work. On the one side of the pendulum swing, you have people who abhor work. They hate work. They don't want to do any work. And in fact, they will do anything they can to avoid work. They'd rather spend all day, every day, doing something else, playing games, or sleeping, or watching TV, or whatever. But on the other side of the pendulum swing, you have people who we'd call workaholics. People who work is basically their god, and they sacrifice everything on the altar of work. Relationship with their family, relationship with friends, their own health. Now, both of these extremes are not healthy. And both these extremes, they come with personal, physical damage. They also come with family damage. They come with societal damage. But yet they're really, really common because we as humans, we are people of extremes. We are people who tend to go all the way in one direction or the other. So this is something that we need to discuss. We need to see what the Bible says about work. So we're kicking off a sermon series discussing God's wisdom concerning work. And we're going to be discussing a number of different aspects of work as we go through this sermon series. Today, the first sermon is going to be about the importance of work. Because, of course, we can't talk about a good work ethic or a work-play balance unless we know what importance God's put, God puts on work. So we're going to be discussing three areas where work is, well, it's important. The benefits of work. We're going to see that diligent work prevents poverty. We're going to see that diligent work benefits your life. And we're going to see that diligent work is overall very wise. Now, before we jump in, I need to make sure we have a good caveat put out here. We are not talking about religious works of merit. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about your day job. We're talking about housework. We're talking about chores. We're talking about yard work. We're talking about labor. Not religious works of merit to try to earn salvation. So just so we know we're all on the same page. So now let's jump in and let's talk about the fact that diligent work prevents poverty. Now this honestly seems like an obvious thing. Like, okay, you want a paycheck? I'll uh, go to work. That makes sense. But... There are many people out there who don't understand this concept. They want to have money without work. And when they end up in poverty, they wonder why they got there. So we're going to start out by going to Proverbs 6. Silas read this for us earlier. Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 11. And in Proverbs 6, 6 through 11, we read, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise. So the writer here tells the sluggard, hey, go watch the ant. Now we're not talking about your Aunt Susie. We're talking about that small bug, the little creepy crawly that might run around your house or runs around outside. It says, go to the ant, observe her way. So watch what the ant does, and you're going to gain wisdom, he says. But who's he talking to? He's talking to here the sluggard. Now what a word, right? The sluggard. What is a sluggard? Well, the Hebrew word which is translated sluggard means a sluggard, lazy bones, i.e. a person who is habitually lazy and inactive, suggesting he has no discipline or initiative. So this isn't just somebody who, you know, they get off of work, they go home and they take a nap. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about someone who takes a day off and relaxes. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about someone who has no discipline, no initiative. They are habitually lazy. They don't hold a job, or if they do hold a job, they lose it really quickly because they don't show up on time. And they take naps midday through their work day. Things like that. This is somebody who doesn't do work. He says to that person, go and look at the ant. Observe the ant. Now why the ant? Well, he says, which having no chief officer or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provisions in the harvest. So the ants, we've all seen them, right? They have the little forager ants that go out and they find some food and then they go back and they tell the colony. The colony follows their scent trail out to that food and then they, they take it back to the colony. 
and you've probably seen the, the nature documentaries, right, with those big old ants down in the Amazon, like cutting up trees or dragging away bigger animals. Now, they don't just do that for their immediate meal. It's not like they're looking for today's lunch. They're taking those things and they store them in their colony. And it feeds the larva, it feeds the next generation, but also when the winter comes, they can survive. You ever wonder why all the ants don't die off when our nice New Hampshire winters hit? Well, it's because they burrow down way past the frost line and they have provisions down there because they spent the summer gathering food. You see, because ants work through the summer and harvest, the colony can survive the winter. Okay. So why are we talking about ants? Well, you go to the sluggard. Okay, sluggard. You want to be ready. Bad times come. You know, you hit a bad season. How do you prepare for the bad season? Well, you work. You store up, right? You make sure that your provisions are laid up for the winter. Because if you don't, well, we're going to get to that in a minute. Furthermore, he says that the ants, they don't have a chief officer or a ruler. You see, ants aren't coerced into working. They work to survive. You don't see, like, a manager ant out there with a whip going, hey, get to work, you lazy ones. They just do it, right? They just go and they work. They work to survive. Now, someone may say, but that's the way God built them. And yes, it is. But there's a great lesson in there that we should be the kind of people who get up and get working not because someone is making us do it, but because it's the right thing to do, because it is the way to, to avoid poverty. But now, you know, we live in the modern society. We live in the world we do. And so someone might say, but I don't need to work. The government gives me money. And this is a common one right now. With I'm not getting political. I'm just stating the facts. With the government stimulants and stuff that have been going out, there are a lot of businesses that cannot find people to work. Why? Because people are saying this. I don't need to work. The government's sending me money. Why should I go get a day job if they're paying for my bills? That's a good question, right? Well, he answers this in the next verses. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. So this statement, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding hands to the rest, is most likely the statement that the sluggard makes, right? They're going, oh, I'm just going to take a little bit more of a nap. The writer says, when are you going to get to work? I'm, I'm going to take a nap first. Okay, your poverty will come like a vagabond, and your need like an armed man. He's, kind of per, he's personifying poverty here. He's personifying poverty as an armed vagrant. Now, that's kind of a scary image, right? Some random dude that just kind of floats into town, he's armed and he's attacking random people. Yeah, that's not good. You don't want that, right? But that's going to be what poverty does. Why? Well, at the moment, the sluggard may be able to get away with it. You know, you think about the first century. They had the, the gleaning laws where the corners and edges of the field would be left for those who were impoverished. So someone might say, well, you know, I can get by on, on charity, and I can do a little gleaning here and there, I can eat the, the fruit off the trees as I'm walking around, I don't need to work, I don't need a job. Just like someone today might say, oh, the government's giving me money, I don't need to work, I don't need a job. But then, something happens. You get injured, or sick. There's an accident. One of your kids gets injured or sick. There's an economic downturn and the money stops flowing. What do you do? Well, your poverty has jumped on you and beat you down like an armed vagrant. That's the imagery we have there. How do we prevent that? Well, diligent work prevents poverty from having power over you. And you think about that armed vagrant who comes in. How do you prevent the armed vagrant from having power over you? Well, you lock your doors at night, right? You make sure that there's a good, strong city guard. You may go armed yourself. You prevent yourself from being taken advantage of. And that's what work does for you. It prevents that poverty from having power over you. But at this point, someone may say, you know, I want to get money without working. 
I get what you're saying. I see that I need money, but I want to get money, and I don't want to do the work. Now, we've all heard of get-rich-quick schemes, right? We probably all have that friend or maybe that uncle or cousin or sibling who is into one get-rich-quick get scheme after another. Or maybe, maybe people look into gambling, things like the lottery or the, the um, going down to uh, Las Vegas or something and thinking, you know, that one big score. I've even talked to people who have said, you know, things are bad now, but I'm going to win the Powerball. Or, you know, I'm taking a, a trip down to Atlantic City, I'm going to win big. Then all my problems will be solved. Okay, what about the person that wants to get money without working? Well, let's go to Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13, verse 11. Proverbs 13, 11 says, Wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by labor increases it. So we see this contrast, and of course the Proverbs do this a lot. They give you a contrast between the wrong way and the right way. So wealth obtained by fraud dwindles. So fraud being dishonest gain or dishonest means. Why does wealth obtained by fraud dwindle? Well, let's use an analogy of little kids, and then I'm going to go into something a little bit more uh, relevant to adults. You ever given a little kid a large sum of money? Say you give like a 10-year-old 100 bucks. What do they do? They go to the nearest dollar store or candy store or Walmart and they buy a whole bunch of meaningless stuff, right? Candy or little dollar trinkets and they have this big bin of stuff that's going to get broken or eaten. It's going to be not worthwhile very, very quickly. But if that same kid works, you know, they do chores, and they get a couple bucks here, they, they go and they, they work for the neighbor pulling weeds and they get a few bucks there. And pretty soon, they've saved their money and they get 100 bucks. What are they going to do with it? They're going to think hard, right? They're not going to go blow it on nonsense. They're going to think very, very carefully what they're going to spend that 100 bucks on. And when they do, they're going to treasure that thing they bought with it because that thing represents their time and their effort. That money lasts. And the same is true with adults. I did some research. And research shows that a large percentage of people who win the lottery go bankrupt or commit suicide within five years. Now that's almost unfathomable because you think they're getting, you know, half a million dollars or some huge amount of money. And most of us probably think, well, if I was given half a million dollars, you know, I'd be doing pretty good. But statistics show that people who win big generally are bankrupt within five years, or they've committed suicide. Why is that? Well, again, because they don't take any value in that money. They spend it frivolously on multiple houses and cars and boats and drugs and all the other things that people spend that kind of money on. And on top of that, they have people that they didn't even know that they knew coming out of the woodwork asking for money. And that's quick win. It doesn't benefit them in the long run. Now, a secondary aspect to that is the kind of people that gamble and play the lotto are people who generally don't know how to manage their money in the first place, because if they knew how to manage their money, they wouldn't be throwing $5 away on a ticket every day. They would be banking it. And so they don't know how to handle their money in the first place. But the point that we see here is that diligent work prevents poverty from having power over you. If we, as adults, work for our money. We go to our job, we spend our time, we get that paycheck. That paycheck represents our hours, our sweat, and maybe even our blood. And so what do we do? We take good care of it, right? We spend it wisely, we spend it carefully. It's not just some random thing that popped into our lives. So diligent work, it prevents poverty from having power over you. But the story doesn't end there. It's not just about economics. Diligent work also increases satisfaction in life. And this is an interesting one. My, my first draft of this sermon had a whole bunch of research from uh, um, secular sources. And I decided for the sake of time, we'd get rid of all the secular research and just look at the, what the Bible says here because it says it quite plainly. Let's start with Proverbs 
26. Proverbs 10, verse 26. And we read, Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the lazy one to those who send him. You ever gotten smoke in your eyes? Yeah, we've all probably been around a campfire and the, the wind shifts and it gets in your eyes and it burns and your eyes water, it doesn't feel good. Or you put vinegar in your mouth and like your teeth like hurt, it feels weird. It's unpleasant, it's not something you go, ooh, I want to have that all the time. So is the lazy one to him who sends them. Or to those who send him. So imagine that, you have an employee and the boss says, hey, deliver this product to our customer at such and such address. Someone who's diligent, what, they'll take the box, they'll go, they'll deliver it, they'll come back to work. Done, right? But the lazy person, well, they might take and they'll say, you know, while I'm out, I'm going to drop by and see my cousin Jeb. I'm going to chill with Jeb for a little bit. And then, you know, you know, there's that new store that opened over there. I'm going to, I'm going to go see what they've got over there. And, oh, I'm so tired. I'm just going to, I'm going to take a little nap just for a minute. And pretty soon it's after closing time and the customer has closed their doors and they can't deliver the parts or the, the product. And so they go home, they sleep, they come back to work, maybe late because they're a lazy person, still having the products in their hands. And the boss says, why didn't you deliver those products? The customer is irate. I'm trying to make excuses. Why didn't you deliver the parts? Is that guy going to hold his job long? Nope. What we see in this is that Laziness prevents job security. And when there's no job security, that results in stress, depression, anxiety, and more. It has been shown that people who get a job and lose a good job and get a job and lose a job and get a job and lose a job over and over and over again have a much higher rate of depression and anxiety than those that just hold a job steady. Even if they don't like that job. If they've got a job to hold steady, they have a lower rate of depression and anxiety than someone who is constantly hired and fired. Job security is huge. And we're going to talk more about job security when we get into next week's sermon about work ethic. But let's continue this, this thought, and let's go now to Proverbs 13.4. Proverbs 13.4. And in Proverbs 13.4, we read... The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made fat. Now, we need to make sure we remember what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the belly of the diligent. We're talking about the soul. The soul is made fat. Okay, so the soul craves and the soul gets fat. What are we talking about about the soul craving? Well, the soul craving refers to a person's dreams, aspirations, and desires in life. So they have goals, right? They have places they want to go with life. But the thing about that, we all have dreams and aspirations, but the sluggard puts no effort into achieving their dreams and aspirations. And we've probably all met people like this, who, they, man, they have big dreams, they want to do big things. But they're like, okay, what's your next step? What are you going to do to achieve that? Oh, it's so hard, you know. School. I don't like school. Or, well... I don't know, I've just had a really rough, you know, month, and things have been bad for me, I don't know. And they never put any effort into achieving those dreams and aspirations. But what ends up happening? Well, that laziness, it results in dissatisfaction with life, because as they go year after year without moving forward in life, they get bitter, they get resentful, they may be mad at themselves, but they're still bitter and resentful they end up with a very dissatisfied life. But you notice what it said there. The soul of the diligent is made fat. That's interesting. See, diligent work, the diligent work towards their goals and they find satisfaction. Now you notice it doesn't promise that they're going to be rich and famous and wealthy. But the very fact that they're working towards their goals increases their life satisfaction. When you've gone whether it be to school or to work, and you've achieved something, and you get home, and you know that you did something. It gives you satisfaction. There is great satisfaction in a job well done. And that, in general, increases your enjoyment of life. But this is not the only verse that talks about this. Let's look at Proverbs 
21. Proverbs 21, 25 through 26. And we read there, The desire of the sluggard puts him to death, but his hand, or for his hands refuse to work. Now, one of the things we have to remember when we're talking about the Proverbs is a lot of times hyperbole is used where it's exaggeration to make a point. We're not literally saying that the sluggard, they have a desire and ah, they die. But the idea is that they're being eaten up inside. Why? Well, their hands refuse to work. This reminded me of a quote from Thomas Edison, where he said, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. <laughs> Very often, people, they have those desires, they have those goals, but when they look at what they got to do to get those goals, to reach those, those levels where they want to go, and they say, work, 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 work. And they say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to work. Worked hard. And so the sluggard eats themselves up inside because of their failure to achieve. And what you'll very often hear happen is they try to project their pain, their dissatisfaction with life onto others and say, well, it's not my fault. It's the system's fault. It's the school's fault. It's the job's fault. Fault. It's my family's fault. It's society's fault. But I never achieved my dreams. And we see that a lot. But the writer goes on. The writer goes on and says, All day long he is craving, while the righteous gives and does not hold back. Again, we have this contrast. And this is an interesting contrast, because it doesn't say the righteous gets to work. Right? It says the righteous gives and does not hold back. So we have this, this huge contrast. The sluggard, they're spending all their day just craving, just desiring, just wishing they had things. But the righteous, well, in order to have something to give, that means they had to have something in the first place, right? So it's implied here that the righteous has been working, but they're not working for self-engrandizing reasons. They're not working to make themselves big and fancy and seen. They're working so they have something to give back. So they have something to be generous with. And we see that motive difference, right? The sluggard is all about me and my desires, where the righteous, well, they're focusing on what they can do for those around them. See, generosity is far more fulfilling than sluggish cravings. You have a much more fulfilled life when you work and then give back than you do when you just sit and desire without realization. So we've seen that diligent work prevents poverty. We've seen that diligent work increases satisfaction in life. Now let's see that diligent work is wise. It is a wise thing to do. Go with me to Proverbs 12. Proverbs 12. Verse 27. Proverbs 12, 27 says, A lazy man does not roast his prey, but the precious possession of a man is diligence. Again, we have a very interesting contrast here. It doesn't say the lazy man roasts his prey and the diligent person cooks his prey. But he says the precious possession of a man is diligence. Well, let's start with the first part. Why does a lazy man not roast his prey? Okay, so he's caught something. A bird and a snare or a rabbit or whatever it is that he has. And he's so lazy, he doesn't even make a fire to cook the silly thing. He just eats it raw. Okay, is that a problem? Well, the National Food uh, Safety Administration says consuming raw or uncooked meats, poultry, seafood, shellfish, or eggs may increase your risk of foodborne illness, especially in certain medical conditions. We see this all the time, right? You go to the store and these stickers are all over everything. Well, yeah, because eating raw meat, well, it carries bacteria and other nasty things in it. You're going to get sick. See, the lazy person will not even put enough effort in for basic safety. Again, the proverb isn't just about, hey, kids, cook your food. It's about a life principle. 
that lazy person, they're not putting enough effort in. They're not willing to do the work to keep themselves safe. And when you see this played out, you see someone who's lazy is someone who they're unwilling to clean up like the food around their house. And so they've got vermin all in their house, getting more illness in their homes. They're unwilling to make sure that fire safety things are prepared. So they have a big fire hazard. They're unwilling to make sure their cars are maintained enough to be safe. And so there are auto accidents and things of that nature. They're unwilling to make sure that if they do go to work, that their work is safe. And so they end up with lots of on-the-job injuries. And we see that, that that lazy person, they're not putting in enough effort to be safe. That's unwise. But it says, the precious possession of a man is diligence. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the diligent person puts in the effort to be safe and healthy. They put in that little bit extra effort to make sure that things are safe around them, that they've got things being healthy. And so people who are diligent, it's their precious possession because they live longer. They have less illness. They have less injury. They are people who, well, end up being a little bit better off in life than the sluggard. But that leads us to a good question of why. Why is that? And there's another proverb that, that discusses that in some very vivid language. Proverbs 15, 19. Proverbs 15, verse 19. says, The way of the lazy is as a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a highway. Now again, you see the contrast between the, the lazy and the upright. The implication being there that being lazy is not an upright thing to be. But the way of the lazy is as a hedge of thorns. Imagine for a minute a big field full of these, these nasty, thorny bushes. You ever try to push your way through nasty, thorny bushes? I had one in my yard, and we, we removed it because it was nasty. And you get close to the silly thing, and it reaches out, and it stabs you. Now, imagine trying to like push through a whole field of these things. You're going to end up cut you're going to end up injured. Every step of the way is going to be pain. Well, how does that apply to the lazy person? Because after all, the lazy person would see the, the bunch of thorns and be like, I'm not going that way. Well, in their effort to avoid work, the lazy person causes themselves harm. Going back to those get quick or get rich quick schemes, a lot of times people who are trying to avoid work They'll go to illegal or immoral activities. Well, I can make more money if I sell drugs. Or, well, I can make more money just simply by stealing it from people. I can knock up the corner store and get a handful of cash. And they end up, well, with a record with the law, ending up in jail or ending up in various other bad situations, or in going to immoral acts, they end up with many illnesses, STDs or the things like that, because they've been trying to get around work. And in their effort to get around work, they end up causing themselves harm. But then it said, the path of the upright is a highway. So now imagine that, that big, wide, clean road. Now, again, this is not saying the upright are going to be rich and famous and have everything they want. That's not what we're talking about. What we're looking at here is that by doing what is right, though hard, the wise avoid harm. They may not be rich and famous. I know plenty of wise, diligent, upright people who are not rich, who are downright poor. But they don't have troubles with the law. They don't have substance abuse problems. They don't have children by dozens of different people that they have to pay alimony towards. They have avoided all those thorn bushes that others have run into. Why? Because they were willing to do what was right, even though it was hard. Now, this is not just a situation that the Proverbs talks about. I know we've been hanging on Proverbs because the Proverbs has a ton to say about this. This is also something that the New Testament discusses. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 3, 
10 through 13. Second Thessalonians 3, 10 through 13. And in Second Thessalonians 3, starting in verse 10, we read, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. That sounds harsh, Paul. He's not willing to work, he shouldn't eat either. And at this point, someone might kick up a whole bunch of what ifs, right? What if this? What if that? Well, let's look at what he says in the next few verses, because the next few verses explain why he says this. He says, For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. So there were people in that congregation, we don't know why they didn't do any work. Maybe they were mooching off the the. Goodwill, goodwill of the congregation. Maybe they were those vagabonds we were talking about earlier. But for whatever reason, they're doing no work at all, but they're acting like busybodies. You see, laziness provides more time for sin. There's a statement that we're all probably familiar with that says that idle hands are the devil's playground. And it is a true statement. When people are not busy, when they're bored, when they're lazy, they find something to do. And very often, what they find to do is sinful. And we see this in action today in much of interactions on social media. Because someone doesn't have a job, they're not working, what are they doing? Well, they're on their phone, maybe scrolling Facebook or Pinterest or Instagram or any of those other things up there. And they end up getting into trouble, right? They end up putting their nose into people's business they end up making comments where they shouldn't make comments. They end up starting fights where they shouldn't start fights. And it causes all sorts of problems. goes on, he says, Now such a person we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Notice this. This is not a suggestion from Paul. He doesn't say, hey, I, I think it'd be a good idea if you guys went and got a job. He says, I command... Ooh, that's a direct word, right? And exhort in the name of Paul? No. In the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a command from Christ to work in a quiet fashion and to eat their own bread. So he says those people that were doing no work at all, those people that were being busybodies, get to work and work in a quiet fashion. Just do your job. And eat your own bread. Don't eat somebody else's bread. Make your money. Make your bread. Eat your bread. See, honest work keeps us occupied with activities other than sin. And this is huge. We need to keep ourselves occupied. God built us to be occupied. And we need to stay occupied with honest work. And that honest work helps us to avoid getting involved in sin. So today, as we've been discussing the importance of work, we've seen that diligent work prevents poverty. We've seen that diligent work increases satisfaction in life. And we've seen that diligent work is simply wise. So my friends, and this is for me just as much as anybody else, don't be afraid of honest work. Don't be afraid of proverbially getting your hands dirty and getting sweaty. Now, I know not all jobs require you to get your hands dirty and get sweaty. There's office jobs, there's desk jobs, there's all sorts of jobs out there. But don't be afraid of honest work. Let's go, let's do our work. And our work may be work at the home. It may be chores, it may be yard work, but let's do our work. And in so doing, we will find better satisfaction in life. Now, today, if you have a need, this hasn't really been an evangelistic sermon, but if you need to put Christ on in baptism or you want to learn what the Bible says about becoming a Christian, we want to help you with that. And in a minute, we're going to have our invitation song, and I encourage you to come up to one of the front rows, and one of our elders will come speak with you. And if you're a Christian and you have a need, maybe you have some, something in your life you need prayers for, the invitation is also for you. Please let your need be known as we stand and we sing this invitation song. <laughs>